Hello, I'm Christina Davis, the Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations. I'm welcoming you here today to a seminar on the digital transformation and Japan's business reinvention. A lot has happened in the last week in East Asia. We have new security agreements between the United States, Britain, and Australia, shaking up uh, alliance and maritime security. And we have a new initiative by China trying to join the Comprehensive Partnership and Tr Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. <laughs> and there's no better person to help us think about change and progress in East Asia than Ulrike Scheide. She is an extraordinary speaker, and I think it's an exciting time to think about Japanese business strategies. Right now, you are hearing so much about global value chains. They are a source of strength for efficient production, interdependence, but they're also a risk to our security for critical goods, ranging from medicine to semiconductors. So much of this debate has been focused on China, but Japan stands at the center of some of these global value chains. In fact, our speaker today refers to Japan as the technology anchor for global value chains because of its success to pursue a niche strategy of innovation and production. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Oriki Shede, who is the Professor of Japanese Business at the University of California, San Diego, Director of the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. She's the author of many books and articles on Japanese business strategy and management. Her most recent book, which we'll hear about today, The Business Reinvention of Japan, How to Make Sense of the New Japan and Why It Matters, just came out in 2020 and won the 2021 Ohida Memorial Prize. I really recommend you read this book. It offers a comprehensive look at how Japanese business has changed to meet the current era while still retaining commitment to social stability and economic equality. You will also find that Professor Shada has emerged as the prominent host of Japanologist website, which offers online commentary on Japanese politics, business society. She hosts the Japan Zoominar, which features engaging discussions on a range of issues, many of which I've enjoyed participating in myself. The success of her website and Zoominars demonstrates her ability to take advantage of the opportunities presented by our move to remote programming, expanding information through digital technology. At the same time, Ulrika knows how hard it can be to adapt. I hear she used to be an avid photographer, but her hobby didn't go well to the switch to digital photography. Of course, it may be she was so busy writing all of these books, she no longer had time for a hobby. But anyways, today we're happy that she's sharing her time with us to talk about digital transformation and its challenge for Japan. The seminar is co-sponsored by the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School, and is part of our special series on Japan-US cooperation in digital governance. I'd like to mention our next seminar will be on investment screening and supply chain security with a really exciting panel featuring leading experts on these topics, Sarah Bauer-Dansman, Sophie Monnier, and Kristen Vicasey, who's here this year as an associate with the program on US-Japan relations. Now I'd like to remind you of our etiquette that you shall keep your microphone muted. And yet I'm sure we'll have many wanting to ask questions. So you may ask a question written in the chat and you may use the raise hand button for me to call on you. And please respect the privacy and not record the event. Now let's begin. I'd like to turn it over to Ulrike. Well, uh, thank you, Christina, for this uh, lovely uh, introduction. And uh, it's very generous. Uh, to uh, to share uh, the, my book, my website, which of course I thought was a joke, the Japanologist, but uh, I am actually by training a Japanologist, so I thought I, I could I could say that. But I do study business. So let me. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I want to uh, uh, share a slide set and uh, speak for about thirty minutes. I hope to leave ample time for questions. And I'm going to go at a pretty fast clip. So if you take notes, and then uh, and then we'll have a good conversation at the end. So let me see if I can get my share going. Uh, I think I'm going to. This is this is my first slide. So here we go. Uh, there's the book. And um, so so this book is about what has happened over to to Japanese businesses over the last 
two decades or so. And um, uh, so I'm a business scholar. So I look at developments in Japan from the perspective of the CEO, right? So how can a company create value in a changing setting? All right, so uh, when I give this talk, I usually uh, encounter many people who are quite negative on Japan. They say, well, you know, 20 years of stagflation, deflation, and the workforce, and the women, and the regions, it's all so bad, so bad, so bad. And um, I say that with the, uh, with the uh, exception of the fact that Japanese companies can't innovate, all of this is true. And if you would like to hear about this, you can go to a bookstore and you buy, can buy a good book on this. But that's not my question with this book. My question with this book is, is if, if all of this is true for the last 20 years, all of this bad news from Japan, how can it be that Japan is still the third largest economy in the world? And uh, Japan is doing this with a workforce of about 65 million people, which is roughly the size of China's three largest cities. Right? So how do we explain that? And so my uh, explanation in this book is about um, the fact that Japan matters uh, because it is going around about this reinvention and this transformation in a very different way. It's slow and deliberate. And, and that's because Japanese society is, is making different trade-offs over stability versus economic growth and that sort of thing. Now, the second point of the book is about a change in strategy, which I will uh, talk about today. And then in the later part of the book, I go into management questions about how can CEOs change the internal processes of work style and uh, corporate culture to uh, reinvent the organization from the inside out? So that's roughly the book. Uh, the elevator pitch is something like this. Uh, so if I only had like 10 floors, I could take you on an elevator. So my book is about how Japanese companies have responded to the rise of China and the globalization of supply chains. And they've done this by moving upstream and um, uh, into, a in, into a number of, as, as Professor Davis just mentioned, a number of critical uh, upstream input market in what I call the aggregate niche. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. And um, uh, that means that Japanese companies now anchor many Asian supply chains, which has created new dependencies that are exciting to those of us who study uh, East Asia. And, uh, and also, and this is where I'm going to end today, it actually positions Japanese companies really well to be front runners in the digital transformation. Um, okay, so uh, now you might say, well, how can both be true? How, how, can, how can Japan be so bad and then this be so great? And of course, first of all, of course, both can be true. It's true for America. There are a bunch of great companies in the US and a bunch of bad things. And it's true for Germany and other countries. I, you know, basically every country I know. And I think what's happening in Japan right now that is this is an expression of the 2080 rule, which is, of course, not to be taken literally. It's an imagery that uh, in daily life, 20% of our effort uh, explain 80% of the outcome, or in business, 20% of customers produce 80% of revenue. And in this case, it is also true that a small portion of Japanese companies uh, create the majority of Japanese economic activity, especially in global competition. So what we want to do is we want to look at that small portion of the Japanese economy that is, that is strong. Okay. All right. So here's again, I already told you what's in the book. So I start with a background. Um, I'm going to talk about the aggregate niche strategy. And then at the end of my talk today, I'm going to talk about how that positions Japan for the digital economy. All right, so why do Japanese companies have to reinvent themselves? So I, I think everybody has an idea about this, but let me just spill it out, spell it, spell it out a little bit. So the first is that beginning roughly in 1995, uh, Japanese companies lost their previous competitive advantage to South Korea, then Taiwan, and then China. And you will, of course, remember, we all, you know, some of you <laughs> may just know this from, from uh, storytelling, but uh, let, me, let me tell you that in the 1980s, you walk into anybody's living room and there would be a Sony TV and a Sony stereo and, and that sort of thing. And now you walk into uh, your neighbor's living room uh, and it's an LG or Samsung or you know, some, some other makers. So, um, so, so what happened there is that Japan, that, that, that Korea and then Taiwan and China got really good at mass producing very high quality consumer end products. And Japan had a higher cost of labor so they couldn't compete. And then of course, the other thing that happened was that supply chains got globalized. What used to be a domestic play with a bunch of subcontractors that fed into an assembler became a global play. 
Right. So in 2008, I wrote a book about it called Choose and Focus. And that was really about uh, what I call the strategic inflection point at the turn of the century. So if you look at the post war, you had uh, Professor Pempel here last week and you talked about uh, the developmental state. If you think about the incentives that the developmental state set for corporate leaders. It was that you would win through size. The bigger, the better. The, the big players in the developmental state of the 1960s and 1970s, the winners, were the large companies, and they were celebrated for their contribution to creating employment and economic growth and exports. And, um, and so companies followed these incentives by diversifying. And then came the bubble economy, and that added sort of exuberant diversification or, or uh, you know, uh, delusional diversification. So uh, by the end of the bubble economy, Nippon Steel had an amusement park and a semiconductor foundry, right? And so, whoa, uh, why, why did you do that? So then the bubble ended with a big um, uh, you know, explosion, I would say, and there were these three excesses. And um, of, of debt and people and, and, and corporate assets and, and business units. So at the turn of the century, companies started to what, what the Japanese called sentaku to shuchu. And my translation of that is choose and focus. That is, they exited uh, these various diversified parts of their conglomerates. Um, I call that a strategic inflection point. And everybody in Japan was excited. In the early 2000s, Prime Minister Koizumi launched a you know economic growth spurt. But but what we know from hindsight is what was divested at the time was mostly the low hanging fruit. That is, the the things that were easy to to spin out. You know, distant like the, like the the semiconductor foundry of Nippon Steel. That was an easy decision to make. Easy call. So they did that. Um, but but at, at the end of, of the 2010s. Japan was still left. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. Um, uh, so by 9, 2019, Japan still had more than 250 conglomerates, which are defined as firms with more than 50 subsidiaries. And uh, also on the JPX 400, which is really the top group of Japanese companies, more than 100 had so many subsidiaries. Uh, they were trading at a, at a discount stock market. And um, and they were also stooped in these old processes. So they were like these these old like like the old sumo of the 1980s, like Konishi in this picture. Staying with the sumo, um, the, 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 the China is, is just huge, and Japan will never win against China with size. It's not not going to happen. The the biggest Japanese conglomerate, diversified conglomerate, will always be smaller than the largest Chinese conglomerate. So the new strategy, and and I told you I'm going to go fast. I'm going to really go fast to this. Uh, is is like this this guy here, which if you remember the old days of the sumo, that was my no umi. Uh, there's a current uh, sumo uh, called Enho, who's a similar kind of a, kind of small uh, skinny guy. And 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 Maino Umi won. He was called the Wazano di Pato, the store of superior techniques. He he was skinny, so he was quick, and he was smarter. He had better techniques than these big guys like Akebono and Kanishki, so he could outsmart them. He could, and and this is exactly, of course, what Japanese companies are doing now. This is the reinvention. Do not compete through size, compete through smart. Smart means superior technologies. It means create dependencies by making things in the upstream parts of the global supply chain that others need but don't have, right? And But to do that, to be smart rather than big creates a whole new management uh, challenge of changing the way the company works. Okay, so this is a thing that many of you have seen many times, right? So the supply chain, in business, we look at these and say, where is the value created and where is the value captured, which is American beauty speak for where is the money? And the money is, um, uh, uh, is, is no longer in assembly. Uh, and, and this realization uh, means, so there's a little money in assembly, but there's much more money in the input parts, and there's even more money in the uh, input materials, and there's a, a ton of money, I meant to put this on, there's a ton of money in the design. So this is, of course, Apple's story, right? So Apple makes money here, and then they sell us the stuff in these glitzy uh, Apple stores, and uh, in between are a bunch of suppliers that make less money than Apple does. 
This is why the smile curve is such a big thing in Asia. Uh, no, no American CEO knows this. Everybody in Asia knows this. Why do the why do people in Asia know this? Because this this explains the, the Northeast Asian supply chain right now. And it was actually first drawn by the CEO of Asa, the the Taiwan based. Uh, uh, founded a uh, computer company that he drew this on a on the back of a napkin and said, look, if you if you put money here and stage of production here, uh, this is a U-shaped firm, a smile. And we at Acer, uh, we're assembling laptops. We're we're here. There's no money here. We need to get out of here, right? And so the money is at the top of the smile. And so if you want to make money and uh and, and, and in manufacturing, you have to get out of the assembly and into the design and component materials, and which is, of course, exactly what Japan's leading companies have done over the last uh, two decades. Uh, so uh, this is 10 years old. Somebody put apart the iPhone and said, OK, let's make sure that we fully understand where the, where the value is actually captured. And so where is the money and where, where do these input parts come from? And they found, this is in 2010, that of the very first iPhone ever made, 34% of the input parts were from Japan and 17% from Germany. It's so a one company that makes these liquid crystals that, that fly through the screen. Um, so, uh, so here's my bubble chart. So let me uh, explain this. This looks a little bit daunting, but but it's not so bad, so trust me, I'll explain it. Uh, so here we have, um, this is a meti Nedo study where they picked more or less randomly uh, some thousand or so products and uh, they, they grow in size from the 1 billion down here, global market size to a trillion here. And this is the combined global market share of Japanese companies in percent of total. And so for instance, orange is automobiles and we know that Toyota and so forth, you know, uh, occupy a third of the total automobile market. There's some orange bubbles here. These are, this is the Prius. Uh, so, and, and the Nissan Leaf, so Japan is an 80% global market share in this. Okay, what I want you to look at is the lower right-hand corner there, the 100% line. You see these tiny little Milky Way dots so that is what I'm interested in here. And uh, so this collection of dots is what I've called the aggregate niche. So, um, so in 50% in of, uh, so in, in a large portion of these little dots, Japanese companies combine to over 50% of global market share. Each dot represents something like 5 billion, 4 billion, so it's small. And none, none of these dots is particularly big, but you know, it adds up, so you know, the 500 times, Two billion, uh, you get a lot of money, um, and so there's the money. And by the way, the the kicker here is that these niches are too small for China. They're too difficult to make, too difficult to imitate, and they're too small. So the large Chinese companies are saying, we don't need to be in these dots. We just buy this from China. So that's okay because they're so small, right? Okay, so you might say, isn't this normal? Doesn't every country have this sort of profile? No. So this is uh, South Korea. Uh, there's a blue ocean in the lower right-hand corner there. Uh, this is the United States. We do have some dots here in the US. Uh, so uh, pink is, is uh, biotech, right? Moderna. Uh, and, uh, and then blue is semiconductors, Intel. Qualcomm. So, so yes, we do have some dots, uh, but not as many as, 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 as Japan has. And by the way, last but not least, bubble chart. This is a recent phenomenon. This is 2006. This is 2016. So this has not always been like, but this is a development, right? So this is, this is a, a movement, if you wish, to the lower right-hand corner of, uh, or the upper right-hand as well, of, of Japan's leading companies. All right, so um, let me just uh, uh, make two more important points. Uh, first of all, this Neto study, this METI study is not an academic study. They didn't take the universe of all products and assess Japan's total market strength. They were, this is not random, right? They picked 900 industries where they thought Japan was strong. Right? So there are more industries, they're, they're, there's more. The second thing I wanna make this uh, point I wanna make is that is, this is not a hidden champion story. This is not METI's 100 celebrated small farms that have a little bit of a, you know, a, a gadget that they can. This is, a, this is the new presentation of global strategies by Japan's very large listed companies. We are talking 
uh, Japan synthetic rubbers, which now no longer make synthetic rubbers. It's a, it's a leading photoresist and uh, a chemical company, TOK, Showa Denko, Kaneka, Hitachi, Panasonic, ADC, Fujifilm. It is, it, so this is the Fujifilm's website. Fujifilm makes Abigan, which has um, a, by the way, Fujifilm's competitor, Kodak, is no longer viable. Fujifilm is a $22 billion company. They're a leader in pharmaceuticals with Avigan, the, the potential virus uh, uh, drug uh, material. So if you look at a screen right now, which you are, there's a 0.8 chance that the, the reason that that screen is good comes from Japan and a 0.4 chance that that is a Fujifilm film in your, in your screen. Okay, there are two dimensions of the aggregate niche that I want to just, uh, uh, before we move on from this, I want to highlight. One is that one company may occupy several of these adjacent tech niches, like in, 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 in chemistry for fine chemicals. The other is that several Japanese companies occupy one technology niche, uh, for instance, in photoresists, uh, especially the very high-end stuff that that companies like Samsung or Qual, you know, or Intel need to make um, uh, 5G generation semiconductors are, are occupied by three Japanese companies. All right, so uh, I showed you the 10 year ago, the, the iPhone. Uh, this is the latest uh, or a year ago uh, for away phone and um, uh, they, they took it apart and they tried to figure out which how much of this is made in Japan and they could identify 23% of the input of this phone. However, they couldn't count some of the uh, two things. They couldn't count some of the important parts like oscillators and that sort of thing. And they couldn't count where the South Korean and Taiwanese suppliers got their input materials from. Right. And that is really the story of, uh, of, of the East Asian trade now that Korea, Taiwan, and China are dependent on Japanese inputs. Each of these input buckets is small, but they add up. And, um, and this is a, 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 this is a the large new next gen strategy of large Japanese companies. But this is Professor Davis's belly wig, so I'm going to be quick here. But if you look at date numbers, uh, the, the trade data, um, so China and Hong Kong and Japan are somewhat even, not quite. Japan, China's a little bit uh, as a surplus, but not by much. But South Korea and Taiwan have a trade deficit with Japan, and China has a trade deficit with South Korea and Taiwan. And so what you get is uh, sort of a, a dependency. All right. So um, I have, I, I told you I would go quick. So I have five minutes or seven minutes to talk about what does it mean for Japan competing in the DX, right? These dependencies and these, 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 these tech leadership. So first of all, what is the DX? Um, it is the, the Japanese and actually the Davos uh, word for the digital transformation in Japan. Uh, so first of all, in, in, in Japanese, this is a digitaru turansforumashon, which is horrible in katakana. So it's clear why in Japan, everybody would refer to this as the DX. Um, and in Japan, not to be outdone, right? There's also the corporate transformation, CX, industry transformation, bio transformation. There are lots of excess in Japan now. There's not a single day um, where you could open the Nikkei newspaper where there is not an article on the DX. It is really amazing. So sometimes it's also called the fourth industrial revolution. In the United States, we don't call this thing the DX. So uh, this is very interesting, but we have these portmanteau words. We talk about tech. We talk about fintech, intratech, agrotech, prop tech, mat tech, med tech, uh, all kinds of techs. Uh, and what that generally refers to is the disruption of how the manufacturing industry works and how society works, right? There's the interconnection and so forth. Where did this tech stuff come from? Well, it is really, it was triggered by the confluence of new hardware possibilities like 5G and sensors and things that speak to each other and vision technologies and the cloud, which is really sort of these huge, uh, farms of, of uh, computing power, and then also advances in software, 
uh, AI ML, so artificial intelligence, machine learning, new techniques for data drilling, which is data connect collection, which is what, what, what Google does, right? And data mining, which is really what the universities are doing right now and trying to figure this out, blockchain, open ledger of software applications. Right? Okay, so the question today here is, or my question that I'm gonna write about next is how can Japan compete and how can Japan benefit from these technology shifts, right? And uh, the, the first thing I'll say is it's already real. And the second thing I wanna say is, I, I'm gonna, uh, I wanna impress on you uh, that this is a huge opportunity for Japan. There is something about the timing and, and the rollout of this that, that really makes this a, a great chance for Japan. So here is, um, uh, some data I've collected for my next uh, book, which is with uh, Kei Shimizu, and it's called, it's about Japan's lucky moment. And the moment that we're talking about here is that for Japan, the demographic change, which is, of course, the shrinking and aging society, because Japan is a front runner in demographic change, is happening at the exact same time as the DX. So this is the working population. We're here someplace. Um, unless something dramatic happens with Japanese immigration or something, over the next two decades, Japan's working population is going to shrink by 20%. Entire population not shrink, but the working population in particular. And this is just two measures that I thought of to indicate the DX, right? So this is internet exchange broadband data. It already was on a high slope and then COVID put it on this mega slope working from home, right? And this is industrial robots, which are... Um, forecast to increase by 5% year on year. So, so there is this, there's this moment where for Japan, these two things are happening at the same time. So what does that mean? Well, it means a number of things. The first, ooh, I'm missing some pictures. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I had some great pictures here of an old tatami maker and an old um, sort of, you know, herbal, you know, salesman uh, in his eighties. And on the other side, a cashierless convenience store where you just walk in and you walk back out and then a record 10 drone that delivers the goods. And um, uh, uh, so this replacement of the cashierless convenience store, what does that replace? It replaces an old guy who's sitting in the front of his house for tax purposes, who is already 80 years old. And, oh, I think it's going to come next. Sorry, I was a little bit confused about my slide. So this is the average age of the Japanese CEO. Uh, in 1995, Meki Data had this figured out. The small firm CEOs, which is what we're talking about here right now, was on average 47 years old in 1995 and on average 70 years old in 2015. These are people who founded their company after World War II in the 60s. And they've run it all the while, and now they're on average 75. So here come my days. This is my the tatami store uh, you know, at the corner where I used to live in Mitaka. This is in Hiro two years ago. So if you look, oh, actually, no, this is in Kunitachi, but whatever. So there is this. And for sentimental reasons, of course, we like these places where we want them to stay. But the reality is that here's your cashless Kombini, and here's your Rakuten drone. Um, but the point is that because it's happening at the same time, what is being replaced is on its way out anyway. So this a lucky moment. Okay, the second opportunity for Japan, so, and, and the lucky moment means that, you know, society is quite accepting of these technology innovations. And the second point is digital manufacturing. So here it gets a little complicated. I don't want to bother you too much with the technicality. The point, the reason I'm going to talk about manufacturing for a moment is that A, it's one of Japan's strong points, and two, it's whether the X is materializing first. This is where it is happening today. Right? So um, many of you have been to an automobile production company, and you remember there's a conveyor belt, and it kind of goes from stage to stage, and a bunch of people putting a car together. Today at the shop floor, this is run by what's called the automation pyramid, where this is the shop floor, and then there's a software layer and another software layer, and then this is six months out planning software layer. The vision of the DX is that we can mesh this, that we have the production at the bottom, and then all of this is interconnected and just one software system that governs the entire automation process, uh, uh, manufacturing process. So, um, uh, uh, Meti uh, a while ago did a, a chart where they said, okay, where's the money 
in manufacturing. Right, so show me the value capture here. And, and the current situation is that this is the Gemba shop floor. There's some manufacturing equipment, there's some numerical controls, there's robots, and a bunch of software. This is the automation pyramid. And the disruption that's happening is right now at this level, where um, there are integrated systems, 5G, all of the parts are connected. There are sensors that, that connect everything. And uh, this allows total process optimization. It allows single lot, high customization manufacturing. So economies of scale may soon be a thing of the past. It depends everything we know about operations management, right? And this is happening right now. Now on top of that thing sits the cloud and big data and, and that sort of thing, which is a, a total database value creation system. That doesn't exist yet. We, we have a few cases, few applications. We're not there yet. That's going to happen in 10, 20 years. Right now, what's happening is this shop floor thing. So I had a, a student from METI in my class, and he was actually involved in putting this thing together. And then I talked to some German engineers how this works. So we adjusted this. And the student went in, and he, uh, he did some study of who competes. Right, who competes in this? And what you see is that currently we have a bunch of Japanese companies like Kiev and Fanuc and Omra and Yaskawa, and a bunch of Germans, Siemens and Trump, uh, Rockwell and Honeywell from the US play. And then there is a Chinese company that bought KUKA, which is a germ used to be a German uh, robotics maker. And then on the software side, it's Siemens and SAP. All right, then the next level. Uh, the, the competition for the disruption is basically played out between Germany and Japan. Hitachi is moving up there, Mitsubishi Electric, DMG Mori, Denso, NEC, big jockeying for position. GE is out, they, they left after we made this chart and, and KUKA is trying and struggling. What that means really is that the, that the Amazon and Google and so forth, they're all positioning, they're playing but they're not in manufacturing quite yet. And by the way, up here, there's also Huawei and Alibaba, of course, and software and uh, recruit. All right, so, um, uh, oh, by the way, yeah. So there are some Japanese players in the cloud when, when, when we say that uh, Japan doesn't have that, that's just not true. And, and footnote, never underestimate the Sogo Shosha, the general trading houses, uh, they're, they're playing there. They're also PE funds playing in this. All right. So I often hear, so go, let me go back to the negativity that we often hear in Japan. There's a lot of words saying, you know, we don't have tough on companies and we will not be able to compete with the Googles and so forth. First of all, I would say to Japan, congratulations that you don't have a company like Facebook. That's a good thing. Um, uh, second, I don't think this is true. It's not true. Uh, Japan has SoftBank Recruit, which is a huge player in this sphere. I could go into this more. Rakuten is positioning, Hitachi is reinventing. And there are many startups that uh, we overlook in this. And there are also lots of companies where the US does not have uh, equivalent competitors. So, uh, and then finally, since uh, a lot of you are interested in political economy, I would also throw out for you that it's not clear to me that domestic competitors may mean a lot in the future because the digital the, the DX, the digital transformation is at its heart a global, a borderless thing. Data are borderless, the cloud is borderless, right? And so it'll be very interesting how political economies are also being reshaped. All right, so let me stop here. Um, can Japan grab the lucky moment? We don't know, we're in it, it's exciting. Um, I can tell you that Japanese leading companies are undergoing a pivot to prepare. They're competing in difficult to make and difficult to copy niches, which positions them beautifully uh, to, to, to compete. Um, this, the, these pivots require a great effort in internal, re, in internal reorganization. It'll take about 10 years for a company to pivot. IBM took it 10 years to turn itself into a new player. So uh, we have to have a, you know, patience. And, uh, but this, this brings a huge competitive advantage. So uh, Japan will be, you know, interesting to, uh, to watch for the next, I don't know, decades. I'll spend the rest of my life uh, observing Japan in this. So let me stop here and open it up for questions. Um, I, I know I've gone really, really fast. So if you wanna go back to any of these slides, I can do that or uh, uh, ask whatever, whatever strikes your fancy. Thank you so much. This was really a 
fascinating presentation, uh, a breath of optimism against all of the gloomy stories. And you really clearly portrayed why Japan had to change and laid out the pathways that these companies have taken, sharing interesting data and an explanation of the strategies that is really compelling. So thank you for an excellent presentation. Now you have said data is borderless, which is a choice governments make. And the niche strategy of global value chains is very dependent on borderless global <laughs> exchange. So in many ways, trade rules matter incredibly for this strategy to work. And so I do wonder, have you felt that Japanese businesses that pursue these strategies are really vulnerable to the talk of decoupling and a change in globalization in a way that maybe other firm strategies would not be as vulnerable? Um, so that's my own question, but before you answer, we have two questions from our associates, and then I'll turn it back to you to make a few comments, and then we'll open up to the audience. So first, I'd like to ask for a question from one of our associates with the program on U.S.-Japan relations, Chinami Iokibe, who comes to us from the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, where she's going to spend this year studying labor market mobility and human capital formation. Yokibe-san, would you like to go ask, ask your question, please? Thank you for the significant implication of Japan's capability. Uh, from the viewpoint of the employment policy, I'd like to know a little more about corporate culture change. Uh, while Japanese employment practices, such as lifetime employment, are suitable for long-term management, uh, they may obstruct the mobility of the labor market which can stimulate the company's innovation. So I'd like to hear about your position about the Japanese employment policy and its possible reform. Thank you. And our second question from an associate will be by Mr. Shinichi Kijima, who works at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and studies small, medium-sized enterprises. Yeah, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, small farms, uh, SMEs are more detailed. Uh, how, how would Japan's SMEs uh, with little manager resources uh, adapt to digital transformation? And also, can the government promote their digital transformation? Thank you. You may now choose to answer these questions in whatever way you would like, and then we'll open up to the floor. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I don't, I mean, I could give a lecture on each of these, so I don't wanna, I wanna keep the answer short, but, but on the trade rules, let me just, uh, I mean, of course, uh, trade rules matter, right? Uh, and, and that's why your work is so important. Uh, because, you know, the, the, it is very important how we structure the rules. I, I would add not just the trade rules. I think it's time to change the vocabulary just a little bit because for Japan, it's also that these negotiations are about protecting the substantial assets that Japanese companies have all over the world, right? So it's 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 a, a properties uh, insurance or uh, I, I looked up the data the other day. It's, it's, it's quite complicated, but from what I found, so Japanese GDP is something like 5 trillion, but Japanese companies generate another 3 trillion uh, outside of, of Japan, right? So they have a huge uh, installations, not only in Asia, but of course also in the United States and Europe. So, um, so, so these are global trade networks, which, uh, which, which goes to my second thing, right? So it's not so much that we think about exports only, as much as exports are still something like 20% of Japanese GDP. Uh, we're also thinking about, okay, so this is a global mesh. And, um, and so, yes, trade rules matter, but the, uh, Professor Davis, we've, we've talked previously about this, uh, this, this uh, 
South Korea, Japan thing about photo resist, right? And um, and so here are the two governments and they're struggling about the photo resist and, and is, is South Korea on the white list or not? And it was really nasty and it went back and forth in the negotiation. Meanwhile, the company at the heart of this matter at JSR was just supplying Samsung out of Belgium. Right. So, um, so yes, it matters, but it's much more complicated than meets the eye because I, 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 uh, the stuff is more and more border, borderless. And you said there is no choice, and I, uh, the governments have a choice. And I think that the biggest transformation for governments, or the biggest change that the DX is going to bring for governments, is that they don't have a choice. The DX is borderless at heart. And the company activities are becoming borderless. I mean, if you go to Silicon Valley and look at Japanese investments and startup companies here and what the, the, re the type of research that Toyota is doing to get into AI, ML and, and data collections. And, and that is that is borderless because it it'll, might get repatriated into Japan or not. So, so I think that um, as much as these trade agreements absolutely matter and are totally important, I also think there's a second part, which is that companies are going to do what they're going to do and technologies are going to do what they're going to do. So we'll have to adjust the way we think about the political economy of those agreements. I'd, I'd, I'd say. And by the way, the digital agency in Japan is super interesting, right? Because um, nobody in the US is even talking about the DX. Nobody in Germany is. And here's Japan saying, we need to reorganize our government, that the silos of the ministries are, are no longer uh, the right way to think about how this ought to be governed. We have to have a horizontal cut through that's digital. And um, and it's it, we have to stop thinking about bailiwicks and turfs of certain government and Meti is in charge of the economy and Moff is in charge of agriculture and you know so that that's yesteryear. So the the future is completely different. It's it's very interesting what they're saying there. So um, so let me let me move on. Although I could go on for hours. Yokita San's question on corporate culture is super interesting. So I have a whole chapter in the book on what it would take to uh, to change culture and. Um, it starts with the challenge of how to even translate corporate culture into Japanese. There are two translations that I really, really do not like and would recommend that we do not use. Uh, one is uh, Bunka, which has this tradition and old and, you know, and temple and shrine. But that, that's not what corporate culture is. And the second translation that I do not like is DNA. Uh, and I don't like it because you cannot change the DNA. Culture, in my view, is the norms uh, that govern the behavior in a certain setting, right? And so in my book, I go into uh, this new research by Michelle Gelfand about tight, loose cultures. And what that really is, is an agreement on the norms of behavior. And, and Japan tends to be a tight, is, is a tight culture. It, it, it scores tight on the research that is done globally on this, which, which basically just means that, that people adhere to the norms of behavior in a particular setting. Yeah, uh, California is a pretty loose, right? So where I am, you know, if I dye my hair green tomorrow and go to work, my colleagues will say, oh, that's cute. But, uh, but if you were to do that, Io Kibasani, and you went into your ministry with, with, with green hair, people would be quite concerned about your mental state. And so, um, uh, so how do you change the culture in a tight setting, right? Well, you have to change the norms that govern the behavior. And, uh, and that is very difficult, but it can be done. Why are so few companies in Japan good at this? It's because it's a lot of work and uh, it's hard and there are very few CEOs are willing to do it, but they are there now. So, uh, uh, you know, I have a case study of, of AGC, which used to be Asahi Glass, which is changing the culture from the bottom up. Uh, JSR is changing the culture. Hitachi is working hard to get people out of their rut. The, the, the pandemic is helping. Right, because you can, and it's not about making making Japan loser, uh, looser, so rather less tight. It's about changing the what is the appropriate norm of behavior, right? Can we 
break out? Can we think outside the box? Can we take risks? Can we step up front? And is that celebrated or is it punished? And so what the culture change agents do in large Japanese companies is they celebrate people that break the norms uh, of, of the current behavior. Young people speak out in a meeting. Uh, people come to come to work with a really asymmetric haircut, right? Those are, those are all things that are beginning to happen. And, uh, and again, it takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, but, but it, is, it is happening. Um, job mobility is also happening. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think, uh, uh, an interesting question. So again, I could give a whole lecture on this, but not everything about lifetime employment is bad. In fact, lifetime employment has a lot of positive uh, 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 features for companies, little turnover, a lot of training in-house, a lot of um, retained knowledge in the corporation, right? So the big challenge right now is how can we change lifetime employment to make it more fluid and not lose everything that's good about lifetime employment? And, and so the, the answer right now is that the top 10% of Japanese employees are, are, are changing jobs at, at very rapid rates, right? So the, even the Datsukan is, is a phenomenon, right? So uh, I just looked up uh, data for um, bureaucrats in their 20s leaving their jobs and the numbers are skyrocketing. Um, the, so there's no part of Japanese uh, business, employment that is safe that the top 10% talent is leaving to places that pay more, allow more, have, a, have different norms of behavior, allow for individualized career paths, right? And so the market is gonna push corporate culture change rather. At the meantime, for the other 90% of the workforce, keeping lifetime employment would be a really good thing. It keeps society stable. It uh, allows people to, to build families and houses and, and that sort of thing. And, and, so, um, and so we've lost it in the United States. And, and I think there are lots of people in Japan that do not want to lose the stability, the stabilizing aspects of lifetime employment. That, that's the challenge. It's very interesting though. On the SME, oh, you know, this is not what my book is about. Um, I, I, uh, but I do have a chapter on the emerging private equity market. And so what's happening right now is that these succession challenges or these small SME that have very little, um, that, that have a technology, but they don't have sort of a tight, efficient management. They don't have the latest operations management techniques. They don't have, you know, strong CFO or something. And there's now a, a cottage industry in Japan of domestic private equity firms that are looking for these small firms in the regions and in Tokyo and in Osaka and so forth. And what they're trying to do is to take that technology, that take those assets, buy the CEO out and turn it around and then sell it into the market. And as that is growing, that is a healthy thing. Uh, as long as it's not just flipped, right? Uh, so these, these, these PE funds usually come in, somebody has an MBA or something, they go, they turn the small firm around, um, they, they, they take uh, the valuable things, they, the CEO gets a lot of money, so they can retire happily and everybody, is, everybody wins, right? And, and that is a very uh, healthy uh, metabolism. And so, so that's happening. So one thing that um, the government can do is support this and it and of course the government does right so uh, Meti's uh, small and medium uh, enterprise agency has huge programs to support those PE funds and also the CEOs and doing this and so there's a lot of interesting activity in that realm and I think um, even though Kijima-san that may not be the answer you you want me to give I think you're doing a great job on that it's working so congratulations So if we accept a borderless world, what's left for government? We have questions from Jeremy Baima and Aki Nakai. And Jeremy asks, well, what about the role of the Japanese government to mitigate intellectual property expropriation to protect all of this innovation? And Aki Nakai asks, well, if there's no mastermind medi role in developmental politics, is the developmental state model over? And I would add, is the digital show taking over 
So as you think about what's left for the role of government in this borderless world of business and technology? Yeah, so so that's, of course, a great question, right? Um, and let me preface this, and then you'll see why uh, by, with this answer. So when uh, the internet first arrived, there were all these, there's doom, doom and gloom, right? The job of the secretary is going to go away, the stenographer, the, the assistant that writes the types the letters, all of these jobs are going to go away. But what we didn't know, of course, at the time was the job of the website designer or the job of the you know, the person that, that helps us on the internet. So the new whole new IT stuff that we needed. So, so yes, jobs are destroyed, but new jobs are also created. And then that's true everywhere. Um, it is also, I think, true for the government, right? That um, of course the government, local always matters. There are always people who live in the locality, right? The, there's always going to be regions and cities and infrastructure, smart cities, by the way, right? So we can build smart cities. So the Ministry of Land and Transportation is super busy right now. Um, there is a whole digital transformation of agriculture. And you could say, well, the new agriculture is actually manufacturing. So do we want to move that into METI? And I asked a METI guy the other day and he said, nah, that's still, that's still vertical. You're still thinking silos, right? Do you know, you're saying that agriculture should be part of manufacturing, but that's still, you know, uh, that, that, that's still the old way of thinking. You have to think new. So the new thinking, what's this thinking outside the box thinking? Yes, the government, of course, will have new roles and intellectual property protection is, is uh, the first one that comes to mind. Then um, you, you, uh, Christina, you, your work, right? So government interaction, the, the Gaimu show, it will, will take on, a, you know, a new leg, if, if we still think vertical, if, if that doesn't become horizontal, right? So all ministries care about intellectual property, all ministries care about um, uh, protecting assets that are global. And, um, and, and so the government, uh, even though a lot of young bureaucrats le are leaving Kazumi Naseki right now, the government will have a new role that's also very exciting. We don't know what that is yet because we don't have it yet. Right? It's not here yet, but uh, definitely the government will matter. It'll be a new thing. I think the de developmental state is on its way out in Japan. It might, might still work in, in other places, but, but, uh, but the it's no longer about development in Japan, right? The new goal is clearly being a leader in the DX. And that's not a development, that is a future looking creation. It's a creation of the future, which is very different from the developmental state, which was about catching up with the United States. But the, the catch up has, has been accomplished. So, so what is the vision for the future that has to be created? And this goes back to Io Kibesan's question, actually. What is the culture change that the government has to undergo? Right there, the government is still thinking in its old ways of let's 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 build big companies and let's have them be exporters and let's protect the small companies. But how about building small companies that are at the at the forefront of of technology? How about um, supporting uh, you know the economy in 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 very new and different and exciting ways? And that's what keeps the what keeps some of the bureaucrats in Kazumi Yaseki is this excitement about they can craft their own new uh, leading role as well. Great. And a few questions in the chat are coming up. So as Kazumi Yaseki rethinks its role, is there still going to be a place for the Hanko? Question from Goodwin Chan. <laughs> And as firms are developing the niche strategy, Hangru Xiong is interested in whether that strategy is mostly going to work in DX industries or is it disruptive across all industries? And finally, I'd like to share, Adam Liff has a question about the broader implications for the US-Japan relationship, especially as we do think about economic security and technology screening, something we'll be discussing again next week. Um, do you see greater US-Japan cooperation as a result of these trends in the business side? Hmm. Oh, that's a great, all, all great questions. Um, the disruption is in all industries. Um, if you wanna have an example, look at Komatsu and smart construction. 
Uh, they actually have a video, uh, so it takes like two minutes. You can update yourself on how the construction industry is disrupted by completely autonomous um, earth movement equipment where the construction worker of the future is sitting where you're sitting, Christina, in a beautiful office, feet up on a little uh, chair completely and, and governing the construction process on his iPhone, her iPhone their iPhone, I should say, sorry. And, um, and, and indeed the, the person in the video is a woman, uh, really well done. So I would, I would recommend that you look at Komatsu. Uh, the, the farmer of the future is a, um, is, is a biochemist and a biologist who, who, who runs a vertical farm that is with, with machine learning uh, uh, settings for optimized sensors and so forth. So uh, yes, uh, all industries has nothing to, so that the, the DX is changing the industries. It's not that the niche strategies change is, is, is so, so I would draw the arrow the, the other way. Um, uh, the Hanko. Uh, so uh, we, we don't have fax machines in US offices anymore, you might think. However, if you were to, uh, Christina, if you were to step out of your office and go to your copy machine, there's a fax machine in there, of course, right? So there is a fax machine in every US office. And the other day I needed a certification from, the, from our US treasury department. And the only way I could communicate with them was by fax. So I actually had to find one of these copy machines to send a fax. But, but the Hanko, yes. So the Hanko is actually a very nice thing. Um, on a, in terms of a corporate culture, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a process that makes sure that every voice is heard. Everybody has to put their hanko in. Um, it's, it's a, and so in, it, within companies, the hanko is just a symbol of involvement and inclusion, right? That everybody has to hanko something before it can go through. And, um, and so the task is to change um to 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 keep that without having to be in the same room and having a piece of paper in front of you right so the culture change that has to change there's not that the hanko is good or bad and and again for sentimental reasons you know let's let's keep it but but the but the thing is can we establish a process where there is inclusion and diversity and discussion of issues with, that 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 allow people to voice their concerns without a piece of paper, right? Without tracing it. So maybe we can we have an electronic hanko or something, but but maybe we can just change the way meetings are run so that it's not necessary to 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 have everybody put a stamp on something. But um, but but let's not. I mean, it's it's a symbol for something much larger, which is a which is a change in in the way that people communicate with each other. And for sentimental reasons, I would just hope that Japan keeps it. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. For big things like buying a house and getting married, it's still a wonderful ceremony. And so, yeah, let's let's keep it. For corporate processes, hmm, can we do a digital version of it? Yeah, sure. But at the heart is the question of what what are the what are the rules that 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 govern how meetings are held, how whether a young person can speak out? I, I don't know whether you're aware, but in the corporate setting, when there's when there's a decision made, where there's a hanko necessary, the angle at which the hanko is placed also indicates hierarchy. So the boss does the hanko straight, and then the second guy is like eleven, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and then the youngest guy will make it you know, horizontal, three o'clock. And so there is this, there is this degradation of indicating status. This would be a great opportunity to get rid of status and these super hierarchies in Japanese organizations. Like let's get rid of it. Everybody can speak out. Everybody should say it straight. Um, so, so abolishing the hanko could actually become a ceremony to change corporate culture in a way. And the good leaders are doing this. It's a, a kind of interesting. Oh, U.S.-Japan relations. Um, definitely. I don't think the U.S. can, can I mean, the, the big problem, of course, is that the U.S. is not aware of this, but, uh, but we in the Japan field know um, the, the, the U.S. can't do it without Japan. And we can't do the DX without Japan. So as I, as I do research on the DX, I often hear this, right? The McKinsey guys and so forth uh, around the world will say, ah, oh, Japan has lost it. Uh, you know, because Japan says that, right? We, you know, we now have instant 
uh, translation. So if the Nikkei writes an article about how bad Japan is, the world instantaneously reads this in English, right? So, so as long as Japan keeps saying how bad we are, uh, we, we're lost, we're not innovative, we're, we're horrible, the world will believe it. Right, and um, and so uh, DC is believing that people in people in Washington are believing it. Japan has lost it. China is important, and um, and that's not true. And, and 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 by the way, there are lots of people in DC who know this, but but um, it, it's not true, and it is evolving. Uh, it's also, it's not true that Japan is not playing in the cloud. It's not true that Japan has lost it. Uh, it's also not quite true that the U.S. owns. Uh, AI and the cloud. That is not true. And um, and we don't know what, what's going on in China right now, really, in, in those investments, but huge investments in, in Chinese infrastructure, right? So we don't know who the winner is going to be. And if the US wants an ally, I think Europe and Japan come to mind first, right? So those would be good places to be allies with. So, uh, so I think there's going to be also an evolution of that and, uh, and a new recognition of, um, of you know, I'm, I'm, Adam asked this question. I mean, this is Adam's area of research. I just studied business, but uh, let me just tell you from the business perspective, that collaboration is already happening. When we go to Silicon Valley or you go to any part in the United States or even in Japan, the US-Japan business relationships have always been very strong. There are areas of, um, of development and research and R&D where it's US and Japan doing it together. So, so there's, there's the politics, but there's also the business. And maybe this is an area where business collaboration can actually drive some of the views that, that we hold in politics. Of course, there's so much overlap between business and security. The internet started in the military development and robotics is clearly an overlapping field. And so the technical innovation in Japan promotes collaboration at the business level, the security level, and maybe the relationships can also end the hanko and have more equality in the engagement as allies as well. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing your book insights with us. We could easily ask many more questions, but uh, we have your book to read and look forward to having future opportunities to exchange ideas with you. Thanks so much for taking time today. And thank you to all of our audience in for participating and excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>